Part 2 of Astounding Stories, January 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Astounding Stories, January 1930. The Beetle Horde, a two-part novel by Victor Rousseau. Dodd and Tommy realized that they were powerless against the monstrous beetles. Chapter 1. Dodd's Victory. Only two young explorers stand in the way of the mad Bram's horrible revenge, the releasing of his trillions of man-sized beetles upon an utterly defenseless world. Out of the south, the biplane came winging back toward the camp, a black speck against the dazzling white of the vast ice fields that extended unbroken to the horizon on every side. It came out of the south, and yet, a hundred miles further back along the course on which it flew, it could not have proceeded in any direction except northward. For a few hundred miles south lay the South Pole, the goal toward which the Traverse expedition had been pressing for the better part of that year. Not that they could have reached it any sooner. As a matter of fact, the pole had been crossed and recrossed, according to the estimate of Tommy Travers, aviator and nephew of the old millionaire who stood fairy uncle to the expedition. But one of the things that was being sought was the exact sight of the pole. Not within a couple miles or so, but within the fraction of an inch. It had something to do with Einstein, and something to do with terrestrial magnetism, and the variations of the south magnetic pole, and the reasons, therefore, and something to do with parallaxes, and the precession of the equinoxes, and other things, this search for the pole's exact location. But all that was principally the affair of the astronomer to the party, Tommy Travers, who was now evidently on his way back, didn't give a whoop for Einstein or any of the rest of his stuff. He had been enjoying himself, after his fashion, during a year of frostbite and hard rations, and he was beginning to anticipate the delights of the return to Broadway. Captain Storm, in charge of the expedition, together with the five others of the advance camp, watched the plane maneuver up to the tents. She came down neatly on the smooth snow, skidded on her runners like an expert skater, and came to a stop almost immediately in front of the marquee. Tommy Travers leaped out of the enclosed cockpit, which, shot off by glass from the cabin, was something like the front seat of a limousine. "'Well, Captain,' We followed that break for a hundred miles, and there's no ground cleft, as you expected, he said. But Jim Dodd and I picked up something, and Jim seems to have gone crazy. Through the windows of the cabin, Jim Dodd, the young archaeologist of the party, could be seen apparently wrestling with something that looked like a suit of armor. By the time Captain Storm, Jimmy, and the other members of the party had reached the cabin door, Dodd had got it open and flung himself out backward, still hugging what he had found, and maneuvering so that he managed to fall on his back and sustain its weight. "'Say, what the—what—what's what, what, that?' gasped Storm. Even the least scientific-minded of the party gasped in amazement at what Dodd had. It resembled nothing so much as an enormous beetle. As a matter of fact, it was an insect, for it had the three sections that characterize this class, but it was merely the shell of one, between four and five feet in height, when Dodd stood it on end. It could now be seen to consist of the hard exterior substance of some huge, unknown coleopter. This substance, which was fully three inches thick over the thorax, looked as hard as plate armor. "'What, what is, what is it?' gasped Storm again. Tommy Travers made answer, for James Dodd was evidently 
uh, incapable of speech, more from emotion than from force with which he had landed backward in the snow. "'We found it at the pole, Captain,' he said, "'at least pretty near where the pole ought to be. "'We ran into a current of warm air or something. "'The snow had melted in places, "'and there were patches of bare rock. "'This thing was lying in a hollow among them. "'If I didn't see it for my eyes, "'I'd think you crazy, Tommy,' said Storm, "'with some asperity. "'What is it, a crab?' "'Crab be damned!' shouted Jim Dodd, suddenly recovering his faculties. "'My God, Captain Storm, don't you know the difference between an insect and a crustacean? "'This is a fossil beetle. "'Don't you see the distinguishing mark of the coleopter, "'those two elytra, or wing covers, which meet in the median dorsal line? "'A beetle, but with the shell of a crustacean instead of mere chitin.' "'That's what led you astray, I expect. "'God, what a tale we'll have to tell when we get back to New York. "'We'll drop everything else and spend years, "'if need be, looking for other specimens.' "'Like fun you will,' shouted Higby, the astronomer of the party. "'Let me tell you right here, Dodd, "'nobody outside the Museum of Natural History "'is going to care a damn about your old fossils.' What we're going to do is to march straight to the true pole and spend a year taking observations and parallaxes. If Einstein's brochure, in which he links up gravitation with magnetism, is correct, Fossil beetles, Jim Dodd burst out, ignoring the astronomer. That means that in the tertiary era, probably there existed forms of life in the Antarctic continent that have never been found elsewhere. Imagine a world in which the insect reached a size proportionate to the great Saurians, Captain Storm. I'll wager poor Bram discovered this. That's why he stayed behind when the Greystoke expedition came within a hundred miles of the pole. I'll wager he's left a cairn somewhere with full details inside it. We've got to find it. We... But Jim Dodd suddenly realizing that the rest of the parley could hardly be said to share his enthusiasm in any marked degree, broke off and looked sulky. You say you found this thing pretty nearly upon the side of the true polk? Captain Storm asked Tommy. Within five miles, I'd say, Captain. The fog was so bad that we couldn't get our directions very well. Well, then, there's going to be no difficulty, answered Storm. If this fair weather lasts, we'll be at the pole in another week, and we'll start making our permanent camp. Plenty of opportunity for all you gentlemen. As for me, I'm merely a sailor, and I'm trying to be impartial. And please remember, gentlemen, that we're well into March now and likely to have the first storms of autumn on us any day. So let's drop the argument and remember that we've got to pull together. Tommy Travers was the only skilled aviator of the expedition, which had two planes with it. It was a queer friendship that had sprung up between him and Jim Dodd. Tommy, the blasé ex-Harvard man, who was known along Broadway and had never been able to settle down, seemed as different as possible from the spectacled scholarly Dodd, ten years his senior, red-haired, irascible, and living, as Tommy put it, in the age of old red sandstone, instead of in the year 1930 A.D. It was generally known, though the story had been officially denied, that there had been trouble in the Greystoke expedition of three years before. Captain Greystoke had taken the brilliant, erratic Bram of the Carnegie Archaeological Institute with him, and Bram's history was a long record of trouble. It was Bram who had exploded the fake Neolithic finds at Mannheim, thereby earning the undying enmity of certain European savants but brilliantly demolishing them when he smashed the so-called Mannheim stone pitcher in 
valued at a hundred thousand dollars, with a pocket axe, and caustically inquired whether Neolithic man used babbit metal rivets to fasten on his jug handles. Bram's brilliant work in the investigation of the origin of the Negrito Asiatic races had been awarded one of the Nobel Prizes, and Bram had declined it in an insulting letter because he disapproved of the year's prize award for literature. He had been a storm center for years, embittered by long opposition, when he joined the Greystoke expedition for the purpose of investigating the marine fauna of the Antarctic continent. And it was known that his presence had clearly brought the Greystoke expedition to the point of civil war. Rumor said he had been deliberately abandoned. His enemies hoped he had. The facts seemed to be, however, that in an outburst of temper, he had walked out of the camp in a furious snowstorm and perished. For days his body had been sought in vain. Jimmy Dodd had run foul of Bram some years before, when Bram had published a criticism of one of Dodd's addresses dealing with fossil monotremes, or egg-laying mammals. In his inimitable way, Bram had suggested that the problem which came first, the egg or the chicken, was now seen to be linked up with the Darwinian theory, and solved in the person of Dodd. Nevertheless, Jimmy Dodd entertained a devoted admiration for the memory of the dead scientist. He believed that Bram must have left records of inestimable importance in a cairn before he died. He wanted to find that cairn. And he knew what a number of Bram's enemies knew, that the dead scientist had been a morphine addict. He believed that he had wandered out into the snow under the influence of the drug. Dodd, who shared a tent with Tommy, had raved the greater part of the night about the find. Well, but see here, Jimmy, suppose these beetles did inhabit the Antarctic continent a few million years ago. Why get excited? Tommy had asked. Excited? bellowed Dodd. It opens one of the biggest problems that science has to face. Why haven't they survived into historic times? Why didn't they cross into Australia, like the opossum, by the land bridge then existent between that continent and South America? Beetles five feet in length and practically invulnerable. What killed them off? Why didn't they win the supremacy over man? Jimmy Dodd had muttered till he went to sleep, and he had muttered worse in his dreams. Tommy was glad that Captain Storm had given them permission to return to the same spot next morning and look for fo up further fossils, though his own interest in them was of the slightest. The dogs were being harnessed next morning when the two men hopped into the plane. The thermometer was unusually high for the season for in the south polar regions the short summer is usually at the end by March. Tommy was sweating in his furs in a temperature well above the freezing point. The snow had crusted hard, the sky overcast with clouds, and a wind was blowing hard out of the south, and increasing in velocity hourly. "'A bad day for starting,' said Captain Storm. "'Looks like one of the autumn storms was blowing up, if I were you, I'd watch the weather, Tommy. Tommy glanced at Dodd, who was huddled in the rear cockpit, fuming at the delay, and grinned whimsically. I guess I can handle her, Captain, he answered. It's only an hour's flight to where he found that fossil. Just as you please, said Storm curtly. He knew that Tommy's judgment as a pilot could always be relied upon. You'll find us here when you return, he added, I've countermanded the order to march. I don't like the look of the weather at all. Tommy grinned again and pressed the starter. The engine caught and warmed up. One of the men kicked away the blocks of ice that had been placed under the skids to serve as chocks. The plane taxied over the crusted snow and took off into the south. The camp was situated in a hollow among the ice mountains that rose to a height of two or three thousand feet all around. Tommy had not dreamed how strongly 
the gale was blowing until he was over the top of them. Then he realized that he was facing a tougher proposition than he had calculated on. The storm struck the biplane with full force. A snowstorm was driving up rapidly, blackening the sky. The sun, which only appeared for a brief interval every day, was practically touching the horizon as it rose to make its minute arc in the sky. A star was visible through a rift in the clouds overhead, and the pale daylight in which they had started had already become twilight. Tommy was tempted to turn back, but it was only a hundred miles, and J Jimmy Dodd would give him no peace if he did so. So he put the plane's nose resolutely into the wind, watching his speed indicator drop from a hundred miles per hour to eighty, sixty, forty, less. The storm was beating up furiously. Of a sudden, the clouds broke into a deluge of whirling snow. In a moment, the windshield was frozen, opaque mass. Tommy opened it and peered out into the biting air. He could see nothing. The plane, caught in the fearful cross-currents that swirl about the southern roof of the world, was fluttering like a leaf in the wind. The altimeter was dropping dangerously. Tommy opened the throttle to the limit, zooming, and like a spurred horse, the biplane shot forward and upward, she touched five thousand, six, seven, and that for her was sealing under those conditions. For a sudden, tremendous shock of wind, coming in a fierce cross-current, swung her around, tossed her to and fro in the enveloping white cloud, and Tommy knew that he had the fight of his life upon his hands. The compasses, which required considerable daily adjusting, to be of any use so near to the pole, had now gone out of use altogether. The airspeed indicator had apparently gone west, for it was oscillating between zero and twenty. The turn and bank indicator was performing a kind of tango around the dial. Even the eight-day clock had ceased to function, but that might have been due to the fact that Tommy had neglected to wind it, and the oil pressure gauge presented a still more startling sight, for a glance showed that either there was a leak or else the oil had frozen. Tommy looked around at Dodd and pointed downward. Dodd responded with a vicious forward wave of his hand. Tommy shook his head, and Dodd started forward along the cabin, apparently with the intention of committing assault and battery upon him. Instead, the archaeologist collapsed upon the floor as the plane spun completely around under the impact of a blast that was like a giant's slap. The plane was no longer controllable. True, she responded in some sort to the controls, but all Tommy was able to do was to keep her from going into crazy sideslip or nosedive as he fought with the elements and those elements were like a devil unchained. One moment he was dropping like a plummet, the next he was shooting up like a rocket, as a vertical blast of air caught the plane and tossed her like a cork into the invisible heavens. Then she was revolving, as if in a maelstrom, and by degrees this rotary movement began to predominate. Round and round went the plane, in circles that gradually narrowed, and it was all Tommy could do to swing the stick so as to keep her from skidding or side-slipping. And as he worked desperately at his task, Tommy began to realize something that made him wonder if he was not dreaming. The snow was no longer snow, but rain, mist, rather warm mist that had already cleared the windshield and covered it with tiny drops. And that white, opaque world into which he was looking was no longer snow, but fog, the densest fog that Tommy had ever encountered. Fog, like white wool, drifting past him in fleecy flakes that looked as if they had solid substance. Warm fog that was like balm upon his frozen skin but of a warmth that was impossible within a few miles of the frozen pole. Then there came a momentary break in it, 
and Tommy looked down and uttered a cry of fear. Fear, because he knew that he must be dreaming. Not more than a thousand feet beneath him he saw patches of snow, and patches of green grass, the brightest and most verdant green that he had ever seen in his life. He turned round at a touch on his shoulder. Dodd was leaning over him, one hand pointing menacingly upward and onward. "'You fool!' Tommy bellowed in his ear. "'D'ye think the South Pole lies over there? It's here! Yeah! Don't you get it, Jimmy? Look down! This valley! God! Jimmy! The South Pole's a hole in the ground!' And as he spoke he remembered vaguely some crank who had insisted that the two poles were hollow because, what was the fellow's reasoning? Tommy could not remember it. But there was no longer any doubt but that they were dropping into a hole, not more than a mile around, which explained why neither Scott nor Amundsen had found it when they approximated to the spot sight of the pole. A hole, a warm hole, up which a current of warm air was rushing, forming the white mist that now gradually thinned as the plain descended. The plateau, with its covering of eternal snows, loomed in a circle high above head. Underneath was green grass now, grass and trees. The fog was nearly gone. The plane responded to the controls again. Tommy pushed the stick forward and came round in a tighter circle. And then something happened that he had not in the least expected. One moment he seemed to be traveling in a complete calm, a sort of clear funnel with a ring of swirling fog outside it. The next he was dropping into a void. There was no air resistance. There seemed hardly any air for he felt a choking in his throat and a tearing at his lungs as he strove to breathe. He heard a strangled cry from Dodd and saw that he was clutching with both hands at his throat and his face was turning purple. The controls went limp in Tom's hands. The plane, gyrating more slowly, suddenly nosed down, hung for a minute in that void and then plunged toward the green earth two hundred feet below, with appalling swiftness. Tommy realized that a crash was inevitable. He threw his goggles up over his forehead, turned and waved to Dodd an ironic farewell. He saw the earth rush up at him, then came the shattering crash, and then oblivion. Chapter 2 Beetles and Humans How long he had remained unconscious— Tommy had no means of determining. Of a sudden he found himself lying on the ground beside the shattered plain, with his eyes wide open. He stared at it, and stared about him, without understanding where he was, or what had happened to him. His first idea was that he had crashed on the golf links near Mitchell Field, Long Island, for all about him were stretches of verdant grass and small shrubby plants. Then, when he remembered the expedition, he was convinced that he had been dreaming. What brought him to a saner view was the discovery that he was enveloped in furs which were insufferably hot. He half raised himself and succeeded in unfastening his fur coat, and thus discovered that apparently none of his bones were broken. But the plane must have fallen from a considerable height to have been smashed so badly. Then Tommy discovered that he was lying upon an extensive mound of sand, thrown up as by some gigantic mole, for burrow tracks ran through it in every direction. It was this that had saved his life. Something was moving at its side. It was half submerged in the sand pile, and it was moving parallel to him with great rapidity. A grayish body, half covered with grains of sand, emerged, waving two enormously long tentacles. It was a shrimp, but fully three feet in length, and Tommy had never before had any idea what an unpleasant object a shrimp is. 
Tommy staggered to his feet and dropped nearer the plane, eyeing the shrimp with horror, but he was soon relieved as he discovered that it was apparently harmless. It slithered away and once more buried itself in the pile of sand. Now Tommy was beginning to remember. He looked into the wreckage of the plane. Jim Dodd was not there. He called his name repeatedly, and there was no response, except a dull echo from the ice mountains behind the veil of fog. He went to the other side of the plane. He scanned the ground all about him. Jimmy had disappeared. It was evident that he was nowhere near, for Tommy could see the whole of the lower scope of the bowl on every side of him. He had walked away, or had he been carried away? Tommy thought of the shrimp and shuddered. What other fearsome monsters might inhabit that extraordinary valley? He sat himself down, leaning against the wreck of the fuselage, and tried to adjust his mind, tried to keep himself from going mad. He knew now that the flight had been no dream, that he was a member of his uncle's expedition, that he had flown with Jim toward the pole, had crashed in a vacuum. But where was Jim? And how were they going to get out of the damn place? Something like a heap of stones not far away attracted Tommy's attention. Perhaps Jim Dodd was lying behind that. Once more Tommy got up on his feet and began walking around. On the way he stumbled against the sharp edge of something that protruded from the ground. It cut his leg sharply, and, with a curse, he began rubbing his shin and looking at the thing. Then he saw that it was another of the fossil shells half buried in the marshy ooze on which he was treading. The ground in this lower part of the valley was a swamp, on account of the very fine mist falling from the fog clouds that surrounded it impenetrably on every side. Then Tommy came upon another shell, and then another, and now he saw that there were piles of what he had taken to be rock everywhere, and that this was not rock, but great heaps of the shells, all equally intact. Hundreds of thousands of the prehistoric beetles must have died in that valley, perhaps overcome by some cataclysm. Tommy examined the heap near which he stood. He yelled Dodd's name again, but again no answer came. Instead, something began to stir among the heaps of the shells. For a moment, Tommy hoped against hope that it was Dodd, but it wasn't Dodd. It was a living beetle! A beetle fully five feet high as it stood erect, a pair of enormous wings outspread, and the head, which was larger than a man's, was the most frightful object Tommy had ever seen. Jim Dodd would have said at once that this was one of the Curculionidae, or snout beetles, for a prolongation of the head between the eyes formed a sort of beak a foot in length. The mouth, which opened downward, was armed with terrific mandibles, while the huge compound eyes looked like enormous crystals of cut glass. Immediately in front of the eyes were two mandibles as long as a man's arms, with feathery processes at the ends. In addition to these there were three pairs of legs, the front pair as long as a man's, the hind pair almost as long as a horse's. Paralyzed with horror, Tommy watched the monster, which had apparently been disturbed by the vibrations of his voice, extract itself from among the shells. Then, with a bound that covered fifteen feet, it had lessened the distance between them by half. And then a still more amazing thing happened, for of a sudden the hard shells slipped from the thorax, the wing cases dropped off, the whole of the bony part slipped to the ground with a clang, and a soft, defenseless thing went slithering away among the rocks. The beetle had molted. Tommy dropped to the ground in the throes of violent nausea. Then, looking up again, he saw the girl. She was about a hundred yards away from him, very close to the fallen plane, 
and she must have emerged from a large hole in the ground which Tommy could now see under a ledge of overhanging rock. She seemed to be dressed in a single garment which fell to her knees, and appeared to fit tightly about her body, but as she came nearer, Tommy, watching her, petrified by this latest apparition, discovered that it was woven of her own hair, which must have been of immense length, for it fell naturally to her shoulders, and thence was woven into this cloth-fitting material, a fringe an inch or two in length extending beneath the selvage. She was about six feet tall, and apparently made after the normal human pattern. She moved with a slow, majestic swing, and if ever any female had seemed to Tommy to have the appearance of an angel, this unknown woman did. She was so fair in that glossy, flaxen covering, she moved with such easy grace that Tommy, gaping, gradually crept nearer to her. She did not seem to see him. She was stooping over the very sand heap into which he had fallen. Suddenly, with lightning-like rapidity, her arms shot out. Her hands began tunneling in the sand. With a cry of triumph, she pulled out the shrimp Tommy had seen, or another like it, and stripping it off the shell, began devouring it with evident relish. In the midst of her meal, the girl raised her head and looked at Tommy. He saw that her eyes were filmed, vacant, dead. Then of a sudden a third membrane was drawn back across the pupils, and she saw him. She let the shrimp drop to the ground, uttered a cry, and moved toward him with a tottering gait. She groped toward him with outstretched arms, and then she was blind again, for the membrane once more covered her pupils. It was as if her eyes were unable to endure even the dim light of the valley, through whose surrounding mist the low sun, setting just above the horizon, was unable to diffuse itself save as a brightening of the fog curtain. Tommy stepped toward the girl. His outreached hand touched hers. It was unquestionably a woman's hand he held, delicately warm, with exquisitely molded fingers, in whose touch there seemed to be, for the girl, some tactile impression of him. Again that membrane was drawn back from the girl's pupils for a fleeting flash. Tommy saw two eyes of intense black, their color contrasting curiously with the flaxen color of her hair and her white skin, almost the tint of an albino's. Those eyes had surveyed him, and appeared satisfied that he was one of her kind. She could not have seen very much in that almost instantaneous flash of vision queer, that membrane, as if she had been used to living in the dark, as if the full light of the day was unbearable. She drew her hand away. Soft vocals came from her lips. Suddenly she turned swiftly. She could not have seen, but before Tommy had seen, she had sensed the presence of the old man who was creeping out of the hole in the mountainside. He moved forward craftily and then pounced upon the sand-pile, and in a moment he had pulled out another of the big shrimp, which he proceeded to devour with greedy relish. The girl, leaving Tommy's side, joined him in that unpleasant feast. And in the midst of it a flood came pouring from the hole, a flood of living beetles, covering the ground in fifteen-foot leaps as they dashed at the two. To his horror, Tommy saw Jimmy Dodd among them, wrapped in his fur coat like a mummy, and being pushed and rolled forward like a football. For a moment Tommy hesitated, torn between his solicitude for Jim Dodd and that for the girl. Then, as the foremost of the monsters bounded to her side, he ran between them. The vicious jaws snapped within six inches of Tommy's face, with a force that would have carried away an ear or shredded the cheek if they had met. Tommy struck out with all his might, and his fist clanged on the resounding shell so that the blood spurted from his bruised knuckles. 
He had struck the monster squarely upon the thorax, and he had not discommoded it in the least. It turned on him, its glassy, many-faceted eyes glaring with a cold, infernal light. Tommy struck out again, with his left hand, this time upon the pulpy flesh of the downward opening mouth. An inch higher, and he would have impaled his hand upon the beak, with a point like a needle, and evidently used for purposes of attack, since it was not connected with the mandibles. The blow appeared to fall in the only vulnerable place. The monster dropped upon his back and lay there, unable to reverse itself, its antenna and forelegs waving in the air, and the rear legs rasping together in a shrill, strident streak. Instantly, as Tommy darted out of the way, the swarm fell upon the helpless monster and began devouring it tearing strips of flesh from the lower shell, which in the space of a half-minute was reduced simply to bone. The most horrible feature of this act of cannibalism was the complete silence with which it was performed, except for the rasping of the dying monster's legs. It was evident that the huge beetle had no vocal apparatus. For the moment left unguarded, Jim Dodd flung down the collar of his fur coat stared about him and recognized tommy my god it's you he yelled well can you he had no time to finish his sentence a pair of antennae went around his neck from behind at the same instant tommy the old man and the girl were grasped by the monsters which formed a solid phalanx about them began hustling them in the direction of the hole resistance was utterly impossible Tommy felt as if he was being pushed along by a moving wall of stone. Inside the opening it was completely dark. Tommy shouted to Dodd, but the strident sounds of the moving legs drowned his cries. He was being pushed forward into the unknown. Suddenly the ground seemed to fall away beneath his feet. He struggled, cried out, and felt himself descending through the air. For a full half-minute he went downward at a speed that constricted his throat so that he could hardly draw breath. Then, just as he had nerved himself for the imminent crash, the speed of his descent was checked. In another moment he found that he was slowing to a standstill in mid-air. He was beginning to float backward, upward, but the wall of moving shells pushing against him forced him on, downward, and yet apparently against the force of gravitation. Then of a sudden Tommy was aware of a dim light all about him. His feet touched earth and grass as softly as a thistle-down alighting. He found himself seated in the same dim light upon red grass, and staring into Jimmy's face. End of part two.